They did earlier. We'll see how far. Collins a win for now. Where did my now I have to figure out where I put my clipboard. I wonder where I put my clipboard. <laughs> Pardon me. Aha, uh -huh, you almost forgot that thing. All right. Hey, Terry, are you ready to broadcast? All right. Or are we going? Hey, everybody. If I can have your attention, please. Hello, everyone. Hello, hello, hello. <coughs> Good evening, everyone. Good evening. I may have, I might, we might need a gavel from now on. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the September meeting of the Madison Astronomical Society. I'm the president, or pardon me, I'm the president of the society, Lawrence Moore, and it's great to meet everyone. Um, it's quarter after seven o'clock and there's a lot of announcements uh, to get through. First and foremost, uh, and, and uh, yeah, it's a great day today to be here at MAS because construction at YRS or I should say Yana Research Station for any of the newbies. Construction at Yana Research Station is now complete and uh, as of last night we re reopened the site for kind of our usual business. Um, but there are some new issues to be aware of and we really want people to be aware of these things because things aren't quite the way they used to be. Um, first and foremost, we have these uh, new uh, electrical outlets at each pad and what there are 14 pads right instead of six pads there are now 14 and they are seven foot by seven foot instead of six by six foot um, and each of these pads have their own outlet their own electrical circuit so you're going to want to notice that on the northwest corner of each pad now there's a, a what we, we call a unistrut sticking up on the ground and and set Mounted on that is a new uh, electrical outlet with two outlets on each, and each of them has a, a GFC style uh, circuit breaker in there. So, and from what I can tell, it looks like these things should be able to keep paper wasps from away away from these outlets. So there's a big upgrade. So, right, it, right, each on a 15 amp circuit. So that's great. That's great news. Now. So when you're out there using the pads, keep in mind you, you, that pylon, that electrical outlet, isn't where you're used to things being. So keep an eye out for those. But it's consistently in the same spot. But it's in consistently on each pad. It's consistently on the same spot, as I mentioned, on the northwest corner of each pad. And so I, hang on. Lawrence, I just wanted to say, the, if, if anybody remembers the video that I did, we had these munistruts buried in the concrete. That's not the case. They are actually on the grass. The contractor said if we put it, mounted them inside the concrete pad, we'd probably break the pads. So they're now mounted actually right on the edge of the pad, they, but they do intrude, intrude into the grass. All right. So keep that in mind. That's kind of a new position on every pad, not a new thing to keep an eye out for. Um, so we need to can now keep in mind some of us have been used to driving our cars in certain areas around there particularly close to the clubhouse 
keep in mind, especially at night, where you're used to backing out or maybe where you're used to driving now has a new concrete pad or two there and there are now uh, outlet, electrical outlets sticking out of the ground where you're not used to them. So when you're driving your cars, be very mindful of that. Also, we have uh, new uh, new grass seedlings put on there and on top of this on top of the loose soil there is now a layer of straw mulch and it's kind of a mat you know mat kind of uh, material a mat kind of product so uh, we have the, this mat covering more or less the whole observing area with the holes cut out where the pads go so if, if it's a little bit damp out there this mulch layer the straw layer might get slippery or if you happen to be walking around the seams of the, one of these mats, it might be a trip hazard. Keep an eye out for that. The topsoil is also loose, even though the contractor, when they put the topsoil back down, they did compact things. But those loose, which it, this and this is great for planning, planting new grass. The topsoil is still a little loose, so it might rut easily. You might, you know, don't twist your ankle if, if a rut swarmed. You know, watch your watch your step. Um, so this is kind of, especially at nighttime when you can't see well. Um, and kind of as a result of this topsoil being a little loose, we really want to keep uh, wheeled carts and motor vehicles away from the areas that have the mulch, co the mulch covering. Um, so keep that in mind too. And we want to protect these new areas with the mulch covering on them for the rest of the season. Um, one thing that we found out now that the deck is gone it may be attractive for some people to walk in, in the area where the deck used to be where there are now paths to just cut across from there to go to the privy but look out that dgro has two support beams for the roof that are kind of low i've hit my head on those more than once when i was working around there if you're in the dark or if you're not looking whammo it's it's not a it's not going to be a fun thing so we're going to put up some fencing, temporary fencing in that area tomorrow, I believe. Um, it's, uh, thankfully, Dave happens to have some stuff lying around where we could just quick, quick put up a restrictive fence in that area. So keep in mind of these six things. Does anybody have any questions or concerns? And uh, hopefully you can join us there tomorrow. Uh, here, as a segue, tomorrow we are going to meet at Yana Research Station at 5 in the evening, 5 p.m. Weather's looking really good, and what we're going to do is we're going to have a special, in addition to kind of having a reopening of Yana Research Station, we're going to have a remembrance for our longtime member, Wynn Wacker. Um, he was a member uh, of this group starting in the 1960s until he was uh, graduated from the UW-Madison. He moved away, came back, was a member uh, in the 70s, was served as president, and had been a, a constant presence in this organization since the 90s and since I've been a member. And he sadly passed away last month. So we're going to have a, kind of a remembrance for him tomorrow. I, uh, some of his friends and family have been invited to be there. And we're also going to have some uh, light snacks and you know some light refreshments to go along with it. And although the, depending on which forecast you look, it's looking like it could be clear or it could be a little bit cloudy, weather permitting, we might even do some observing tomorrow night. So uh, we hope to see many of you there at Yana Research Station tomorrow at 5 p.m. Does anybody have any questions or comments? Oh, yes, Ed? Uh, just wondering about parking. Parking. Um, we'll kind of figure that out because I, I, I haven't, um, some of the parking should be more or less as it normally is in the area closest to the clubhouse. Maybe not so much anymore because now the pads extend further away from the clubhouse. And some, I mean, I, I used to quite often park kind of next to the clubhouse. But if you back out from that area now, for those of us who can imagine it, you're going to you potentially run over a concrete pad or a, an electrical outlet or two. So we're going to. As we're kind of all looking over the site tomorrow, we might want to kind of work some of those things out. But the area further away from the clubhouse where we normally park, the area between the
privy and the DGRO and also that wide open area on the other side of the Arbor Vitae should be fine for parking. And also Carson and Yana's adjacent property that used to be a, a kind of an open field. He has expressed more than once to us that we're welcome to park in that area if we need to. Yes, sir, Yeah, the, uh, the area between the DGRO and the privy, there was trenching down there. So you, there may be room for one car, maybe two if you're lucky. And on the other side of the, by the uh, coming in off uh, Kelly Road, the driveway there, there is also an area that they seeded and covered up. So there's a limited parking there also. And, and keep in mind, if it's an area that has the straw mat covering it, don't park there. And we want to kind of, in those areas too, you know, be, you know, mindful of how much, you know, how, we don't want to form ruts and things if we can help it. Any other questions? Yeah. Oh, yes, Kevin? Yeah, I just wanted to mention, too, there is enough room to turn around there uh, to pull up by the clubhouse still. You just have to be a little bit careful just not to pull too far away. And that's what worries yeah. me, because and, and, if people are, if they're, you know, not paying attention to just right. the moment, and they're not, especially at nighttime, it can be a little disorienting. Right. It, it could be a problem. And I would say, too, if you're not going to be there uh, for the ceremony tomorrow, and you want to use the facilities and sometime in the future i would strongly suggest that you your first trip there be in the daytime so you can kind of get the lay of the land and see how everything's put together uh before you just show up at nighttime and stumble around and not necessarily know what you're doing because there are a lot of changes great suggestion all right so that covers the event special events tomorrow um, we also have a very special yearly uh, ritual coming up called the membership renewal invoices, which are going are out in the mail. You're going. Do you have an update on that? Oh, sorry. To, yeah, we'll give the microphone a little. We're giving time. John a good workout. Um, the I'm going to mail all the invoices out on Monday, and everybody gets one, even if you've prepaid, because I also want you to update your contact information if necessary. And we received one new membership tonight, and that's going to set a new record in the time that I've been treasurer as to the number of members of MAS. Right now, if, once I put them in, will that be at 133? Will he have to renew? Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> no, just kidding. Our, we'll have to say hi to you. We'll say hi in a minute. All right. Maybe you'll get here by the time the announcements maybe, maybe. get rounded up. All right. So if you happen to want to come here at UW Space Place this Tuesday, there's going to be a guest presentation called Our Solar System's Five Billion Year Future by Professor, Mil Prof Professor Melinda Suarez Furtado, Furtado of the UW Madison Department of Astronomy. Um, so it sounds like you know what happens when the sun's lifespan kind of fizzles out what will happen to the solar system if you're interested in that this tuesday night at seven o'clock is the place to be coming up next month we will be back here for our monthly meeting on friday october the 13th my favorite friday the 13th in the whole calendar is the one in october for because it's so close to halloween yeah there yeah of course Duh. well anyways it could be a very scary meeting. <laughs> All right, yes, we will have a presentation by MAS member Rick Wayne, Rick Wayne titled Increasing Vision. Um, John, do you want to give us a brief synopsis about that? Rick Wayne is a relatively new member. He's, he's maybe been in the club for a couple of years, and he is one of those people who jumped into astrophotography you know, a couple of years ago, maybe three or four years ago, and had no idea how deep the pool was when he jumped in. So basically, Rick is just going to kind of take us through um, his journey, show us some pictures, and talk about gear uh, and, and photos. Sounds great. Thank you, John. Also coming up next month, uh, weather permitting, we can plan a monthly star party at Yana Research Station on Saturday, October 14th. Uh, I guess. Uh, Six, the sunset will be closer to 6 p.m. around then, so uh, 
details will be announced as the date comes up. Um, also on Friday, October 20th, we will be having Moon Over Monona Terrace. So for any of you who would like to volunteer for that event, this is where we get 15 to 20 telescopes up on the roof of Monona Terrace and a bunch of uh, families and people of all ages come up and many of them look through a telescope for the first time and it's just a great place to be. So we'll make share more details about that as the event comes up. And we'll also be looking for volunteers. Does anyone have any other announcements or concerns that they'd like to share? If not, yes, we did have, I guess it sounds like we did have somebody join the club tonight. Uh, uh, would you like to introduce yourself, sir? Uh, sure. Uh, my name is Ryan. Um, I was a astrophysics major at UW, graduated 2020, um, and I started uh, astrophotography uh, last summer, um, kind of a couple years ago, but with equipment delays and everything, that took a lot longer. Um, so yeah, I've been just kind of really wanting to get back into the astronomy community, um, meet some more people. And this is, a, this is a great place if, if you're a person that's interested in getting your feet wet in astrophotography or just visual observing. This is a great place to come out and uh, visit people when they're observing at Yana Research Station and you know, kind of find out how people like to do things. It's a great way to learn. It, I, I have one of these weird things where I have a really short attention span and I forget information really quick. What was your name again? Ryan. Ryan. It's great to meet you, Ryan. Thanks for being here tonight. Is anyone else? It's, oh, yes, you're good. Yes, the plaque, I did not know it was going to be here in my note in tonight, so it's not in my notes. Um, for those of you who donated to the uh, renovation project at Yana Research Station, your name is now on a plaque, and we will be, in addition to remembering when tomorrow, we also will be finding a place to mount the plaque into the clubhouse in a very prominent location. So it's, it's in the back on the piano, and... Be sure to have a look at it before you leave tonight. All right. I see. Oh, yes, you're going to. I so also want to mention uh, when you go out tomorrow night you can, and you, you uh, ended up getting a brick, try to find yourself. Because they're in a, other than winds, they're in a pseudo-random order. I, I already let Jeff know that uh, Avtar got his spot. <laughs> it was and it was all it was all done ram, randomly except for when spot we put when in a special location. Oh, you're not so. supposed to admit that. It was just luck. It was just luck. Yeah, it was just luck. Yeah. All right. Are there any further uh, comments or announcements anyone would like to make? If not, I see it's already after uh, 7:30, and our guest presenter tonight is a fellow who uh, has been a great friend and member of this club for ever since I've been here. And he is also a great and enthusiastic camper and traveler. And he is here to share with you all of his cumulative wisdom about traveling and seeing really awesome astronomical events. I introduce to you uh, MAS President Emeritus John Rummel. Thank you. Testing, can you hear me? So uh, we're going to talk about solar eclipses tonight. We have two events coming up in the next six months, seven months, uh, including one next month. So um, I titled it, why, why Solar Eclipses Matter and Why Totality Matters More Than Anything. Because when we went through this back in 2017, as the club promoted the 2017 eclipse, I learned that um, people who are not amateur astronomers, people, you know, members of the general public, think differently about solar eclipses than I want them to think. And so tonight we're really going to sort of focus on um, some, some things that, that the general public might, might not be aware of. Um, so if, you're, if you came here tonight to, to learn about the eclipses, you're in the right place. The photo um, that I'm using there is one of Dan's, uh, Dan Hislop, uh, in 2017. Uh, I was standing about 50 feet away as Dan took this photo. We observed together in Central Oregon, and I'm happy to say that we're planning to observe again in Southern Texas in uh, April. Uh, families, you know, uh, doing this trip, you know, together. So, um, two events. 
The first one is an annular eclipse. And this one happens next month in October. And an annular eclipse, uh, for those of you who don't know, is different than a total eclipse. An annular eclipse is a subset or part of the subgroup of partial eclipses. It's not a total eclipse. Um, you've heard of the supermoon phenomenon when the moon is closer and bigger and everybody on the internet tells you how it's going to be so big that it's going to take your breath away and then it just looks like the moon. The moon's size is very subtle, but it does vary. And annular eclipses generally happen when the moon is further away in its elliptical orbit around the Earth. So the angular size of the moon is a little bit smaller, and it's not big enough to cover the disk of the sun. And so you get what people have called the ring of fire. The Latin word annulus means ring. And so an annular eclipse is spectacular, and it's definitely worth seeing. And I'm going to talk about how you can do that tonight. But an annular eclipse and a total eclipse are very, very different. And we'll talk about how. The other event is the total solar eclipse next April, April 8th, 2024. And this is the main event because totality is something that if you've never seen, that you really want to take the opportunity to see. And next, next April is a great opportunity. And I want everybody in this room who hasn't considered making the road trip necessary to do this to really consider strongly why you need to do it. So tonight, I'm not really going to talk about the science of eclipses. I'm not going to talk about the historical importance of eclipses. I'm really just going to share some general information and background, and I'm going to try to share some motivation uh, for why you should make an effort to, to do this. I also want to point out that next March, our April, our, our, the meeting preceding the April eclipses, March 8th, uh, exactly one month prior to the eclipse, Jeff Shockler, who is in the room, and Bob Hamers, another member of ours, is, are going to do a presentation. Now, Jeff and, and Bob have not let me know the particulars of their talk, but I'm, I'm assuming that they're going to talk a little bit more about photography, how to take pictures, what to know, what, what kind of equipment they're going to use, and what kind of equipment you might be able to use. Theirs is going to be a more nuts and bolts kind of a presentation. I'm not sure who is the nut and who is the bolt, but Jeff and, and Bob will let us know that in March. Uh, so that's, that's what we're going to do tonight. But first, we'll look back to August of 2017. This is an event that many people in this room participated in. Many of you took the trip necessary to get yourself into the path of this event, which means you've got yourself under the moon's shadow. And for those of you who did that, you know what I'm talking about. For those of you who have never done it, and maybe in, in August of 2017 you took a pass because you had to work, or because there was something else going on, or you settled for where you were, you know, and saw a partial eclipse, that was great, but I'm going to try to convince you tonight to, uh, to go further. Um, this is one of my daughter's pictures from that event, um, set up again, just feet for me and, and with Dan and his family. Um, the, uh, and she is very thrilled with these pictures. She and I are getting together again for the April event in Texas. So um, it's, it's definitely worth doing. This is my picture. I only set up a camera with a wide field lens. And so in, in that picture, you can see my daughter right here taking the pictures that I just showed you. And over here is Dan at his telescope, Dan Hislop, and his whole family there um, uh, observing the eclipse in Oregon. Um, six years ago. And I, I'll point out to you that Dan and his family spread out some sheets on the ground. There you can see them over there on, on the right. We'll talk about why they did that in a little while too. Yes? Uh, Andrea's pictures? This one? I do not remember. It was on the order of you know, some significant fraction of a second. So maybe a half of a second, maybe you know, something. Because it was, it was dark. Uh, totality dark, and and the sun, you know, the corona is pretty blown out. Uh, but you know, half a second, I'm going to say something like that. So eclipses, diagrammatically, you know, it's when the moon passes between the Earth and the sun, and uh, the sun casts a shadow of the moon on the Earth. And so you can see, as the shadow of the moon falls on the Earth, there's this little dot, kind of exaggerated in size, but that dot is the zone of totality. And as the moon orbits the Earth and the Earth rotates and, and the Earth is orbiting the sun, that 
path of totality, that, that dot passes across the earth in a path that takes about five or six hours to sweep across the earth. And anybody who is under the shadow in that dark area will see a total eclipse or a central annular eclipse if, if you take next month's case. Um, but if you imagine the, um, you know, the dot of the shadow of the moon there drawing a line as it progresses across the earth, then you get that path that is often diagrammed on maps like this. And this map um, diagrams both of the eclipses that are coming up uh, in the next couple of months. So there on the left, sweeping downward from, from the Pacific Northwest down through Texas, is the annular eclipse that's happening next month. So you get yourself under that shadow, or into that path, and you will see the central annular eclipse. If you're any place outside of that path, up to several hundred miles on either side, you'll see a partial eclipse where the, the moon partially covers the sun and you get you know, the crescent shape or you know, the cutout of the sun. Uh, so you know, again, we want to encourage you to travel to get into the, uh, the path of totality or the path of annularity as, uh, as this one illustrates. And the other one sweeping from Mexico and Texas up through the, the northeast is the April 2024 total eclipse. And I want to point out to you, uh, you know, look at where Madison is and look at where that path crosses um, the states of Illinois and Indiana. It's not that far away. It's really only about a six or seven hour drive from Madison to get yourself under that shadow. And again, I'm going to really focus tonight on why I think you should do that. If you're like me, you're fascinated by that crossing. This, this idea that this small area of Texas is going to see both a central annular eclipse and a total solar eclipse inside a six month period just boggles my mind. Um, this is the area zoomed in. You can see the paths crossing there. Anybody inside that square, if you live inside that square, you don't even have to leave home and you will see both of these events in the next six months. The camp the camping place where I'm going to be and where Dan and his family are going to be joining us next April is right around where that sun is. It's near the center line of both events. Um, and I don't know if I'm going to actually observe from the campsite or if I'm going to travel a few miles to get myself closer to the center line. We'll see. That's, that's all going to come out in the wash in the next couple of weeks. But that is, um, that's the intersection of those two events. Uh, those of you who observed down at Carbondale, Illinois, in that region, in 2017 may in fact be going back to Carbondale because Carbondale is the location of the crossing of the 2017 event and the 2024 totality. So you don't have to travel too far. Um, this is the path of the October 14th annular eclipse. I'm not going to talk a whole lot about the annular tonight. So I'll just say a few words about this. Um, all the way from Oregon down through um, the Gulf Coast of Texas and then into um, you know, the Caribbean. But uh, the annular eclipse is the event that looks like this, the ring of fire. So again, this is a partial eclipse. The exposed portion of the sun made up by that ring is unfiltered naked solar energy. If you look at that with your, with your unfiltered eye, you could damage your eyes in very short order. Or if you point a camera or a telescope without appropriate filtration, you could damage your, your, your telescope or your camera and your eye if you look through something with magnification. So observing an annular eclipse requires all of the care and caution and wisdom and equipping yourself with, with the proper tools that any partial solar eclipse does. But the payoff is you get to see this. And this is, this is a fantastic view. Um, not many people have seen annular eclipses. It's definitely worth traveling if you have the opportunity to do it. Here are a couple of pictures people took of annular events when the sun and the moon were low in the sky using, in these, both of these cases, um, natural atmospheric filtration. This is dicey and dangerous because you never know when the cloud filtration, the atmospheric filtration is going to be enough. But both of these people got away with taking pictures of nearly central and central annular events with just the atmosphere um, filtering. 
The event coming up next month is not one of these because nowhere along the path in the U.S. will the sun be lower than 30 degrees elevation. 30 degrees is pretty high to look at the sun unfiltered. You're going to need to use appropriate um, filtration. So the annular event is a great opportunity um, to do this observing with appropriate equipment. The best equipment, in my opinion, that you can get is a cheapo pair of eclipse glasses. Modeling the use here is me and my daughter in Oregon in uh, 2017. These glasses um, are very inexpensive. These are not sunglasses. These, the, the film in those glasses is specially prepared, certified solar filter film, which knocks out 99.9999% of the sunlight. So you can look safely at the sun with these on. This is really the best tool because it's the most inexpensive and it's really a satisfying way to view a partial eclipse or an annular eclipse. If you want to go further, there are oodles of options for solar filters, for telescopes, for binoculars, or for camera lenses. Um, here are a few of the more popular ones. I just pulled these pictures off the web. You can also purchase solar film, uh, usually made by the company Botter, and directions, uh, you can download the directions off the internet too, and you can make your own solar filter. Over on the uh, stand at the side of the room, Bonnie, raise your hand, Bonnie. Bonnie has brought a couple of homemade solar filters that she made, um, and they're just laying over there. You can go over and take a look at them. Beautiful handiwork. They're easy to make. Um, the film itself, the, the package you can see, this is Butter Planetarium. Um, you know, a package of maybe uh, 18 square inches of the film usually costs like maybe 10 to $12, something along those lines. Maybe a little bit more expensive in the year where we have two eclipses coming up, but it, it's still available online. Some places sell out. Some places sell out of the eclipse glasses as you get closer to the events, but you can still find those glasses online and you might even be able to find some locally. Jim might have some available here at Space Place. I didn't ask him, but uh, Jim often will sell eclipse glasses. So make sure you equip yourself for safe viewing. That's all I'm gonna say about the annular. I call the April event, April 8th, the main event, because that is a total solar eclipse. And this is really the one that if you, if you have a chance to do it, you really ought to do it. The event next month, um, October 14th, is a Saturday. April 8th is a Monday. It's usually a work day for those of you who still work, uh, but it's worth taking a day off. And you really don't need to take any more than a day off. You could take a couple days off, Saturday, Sunday, Sunday, Monday. Um, but it's worth, it's worth doing. And again, the path from, from Mexico up through Texas, crossing a number of, of states, this is a diagram that, that they call it the best cities. Every, um, every location inside that orange line is in the path of totality. It's estimated that approximately 32 million people live in that path. 32 million people who don't even have to travel. They can just step outside of their front door and they can witness this, this event. If you, if you expand that line to include, say, a five or six hour driving radius, which would include Madison, it's like 100 million or more people are potentially going to be interested in this event. If you observe the 2017 eclipse or, or if you've been to other eclipses, um, those of us who did it can, can attest to the fact that after the eclipse is over, the traffic jams are just as epic as the event was because thousands of people are leaving and trying to get home or trying to get back to work or, or doing whatever. Um, in Oregon, it was like, um, it was like Woodstock letting out. And, and it was just, I mean, the, the traffic jams were just nuts. But it was great because everybody was so stoked and everybody was, was still so high you know, from, from witnessing the event, and it was just great. So I've noticed in talking about eclipses, as I talk to my friends, my colleagues, who aren't amateur astronomers, and the only thing they really know about eclipses is, you know, the sun's going to cover, the, the sun's going to be covered by the moon. The moon's moving in between the earth and the sun. They don't really distinguish between partial 
and total eclipses. And for people who have never seen totality, it's kind of an abstract concept too, but at least amateur astronomers usually get it a little bit more. But I just want to take you through a hypothetical to talk about why I think this is so important. So let's use as our hypothetical this, I zoomed in now on the path, so we're looking at the part of the path that crosses Indianapolis. You can see Chicago uh, at the top center, and then Madison is, is up at the very top on the left-hand side. To see the total eclipse, you have to be inside the path of totality. So let's say that you work in Chicago, and you're going to be in Chicago, Chicago that day, and you're not an amateur astronomer, but you've, you, know, you follow the news, and you've got friends like like me or like you know the people sitting in this room and you've been told that in Chicago the coverage of the sun will be about 94% and you're thinking to yourself 94% that's a pretty high percent right you know if I'm in school and I take a test and I get a 94% I'm really happy with that um, I might even get a sticker um, and you know my parents might even put it on the refrigerator with a magnet 94% is a pretty good number. When you're talking about eclipses, close is not enough. 94% is a great partial eclipse. In fact, it would look something like that. Very, very deep coverage of the sun. Just a crescent. Just a sliver of sun remaining. I'm not knocking a partial eclipse. That's a really cool thing to look at. But you're so close. It's worth traveling that extra couple of miles. So. I'm going to move to another map. We're just going to zoom in. So now we've zoomed in on Indianapolis. The red line is the northern limit of totality. The blue line down at the bottom is the center line of totality. So you can see Indianapolis is deep in the path of totality, but it's not quite at the center. And Chicago is now you know, off the map. So you know, you've listened to my spiel, and you've decided to take the, take the uh, afternoon off from your Chicago job. And you've got a sister who lives in Lafayette. So I'm going to go to my sister's house, right? In Lafayette, you looked it up on the internet, 99.5% coverage. Now, you know, within a rounding error, that's 100%, right? It's still, it's a partial eclipse. Lafayette is only 20 miles from the northern limit, 20 miles. And that last half percent, that last 20 miles, makes a difference. Now, I couldn't find a picture of a 99.5% obscured sun, but it's a very thin crescent, thinner than this, but it's still not totality. The exposed chromosphere, you know, light-emitting surface of the sun there would be so bright that you're still risking eye damage, you're still risking camera damage if you look at it with an unfiltered eye. You're not going to see totality in Lafayette. Lafayette is only 20 miles. So you look at the map, and you look directly due south, and you've got Crawfordsville, Indiana. I've been to Crawfordsville. I used to live in Indiana. Crawfordsville is just inside the path, just barely inside that line. Crawfordsville would be a good location, you know, if you drive that last half an hour south of your sister's house in Lafayette. Crawfordsville has 100% coverage. Crawfordsville will see totality. So if that's as far as you can go, if that's all you can do, you know, get to someplace like Crawfordsville. You see totality. You see a total solar eclipse. The downside is that Crawfordsville, um, its proximity to that northern limit, it's very close to the edge of the shadow path. Crawfordsville only gets 40 seconds of totality. 40 seconds. Now, it's going to be a great 40 seconds, but it's only 40 seconds. If you were, for instance, to go to downtown Indianapolis, about an hour away by car from Crawfordsville, downtown Indianapolis also sees a total of 3 minutes and 51 seconds. If you go even closer to the center line, which is to the south um, east of the center of Indianapolis, uh, the eclipse there is 4 minutes and maybe 4, four minutes and 10 seconds, something like that. So central Indianapolis at 3 minutes and 51 seconds. That's really, really good. You want to get into the path of totality, and you don't want to limit yourself just to the edge. You want to get 
closer. Although there, there are people who actually seek out the edge because there are some phenomenon, phenomenon that you see, like the Bailey's beads and some of those edge phenomenon that you can see from the, um, the edge of totality. But I recommend you get as deep into the path as you can. It's really worth going. Now, to illustrate why it's worth it, I'm going to show you some video. Um, this is a video that was taken by an astronomer named Fred Espinac. Fred Espinac, now retired, is he was a solar physicist with NASA. Fred Espinac is the, is the veteran of something like 70 e eclipses in his life. He's, he travels the world. He got paid to do it by NASA. But Fred often will film video. The voice you hear, because this has audio, and I hope that it's, it's loud enough for the system, the voice that you hear primarily will be Fred's voice. But I want you to listen to this. The pictures are cool, too. And you, you'll see his video of the eclipse. But I want you to listen to the audio because I want you to listen for the, um, the emotional content of the experience of the people who are observing this with right now. He's in China, and I think that he's with a lot of Americans, so there are a lot of English speakers, but I believe there are also a lot of Chinese nationals, a lot of non-English speakers, potentially non-English speakers, but just listen to the, the response and the reaction. the unfiltered view. Thirty seconds until the end of totality. So Fred, that, that was principally Fred Espinac's voice, and he was the one going, woohoo, you know, there at the end. Um, and this guy's seen 70 eclipses. Um, it happened where we were in Oregon. Um, I, I've heard from people who were in Illinois. Um, there is something about the experience that is, it elicits responses from people that you generally only see on roller coasters. <laughs> Um, it, it's, it's, it's an amazing experience. Uh, it's, it's not a stretch to think, you know, here, here we are in the 21st century. You know, we know what causes eclipses, but, you know, imagine thousands of years ago people seeing this and not understanding the, the mechanics of the solar system. It's not difficult to see why people were terrified of things like this and why people created all sorts of mythologies and, and even, you know, religions based around celestial heavenly objects when you see something like this. Um, we're going to come back to the experience in a bit. Um, looking, you know, once more at just that, that geometry, um, because of the way that shadow moves, the speed with which the shadow moves, any location in the shadow generally experiences, you know, between a minute or two, up to a maximum of about seven minutes of totality. The longest an eclipse can be is uh, seven minutes and some, some seconds. Um, the one coming up in April 
is four minutes and change. It's a pretty good one. Um, there are some other opportunities coming up in, in the next you know, couple of years with longer periods of totality, uh, but not in the continental US. You have to travel for those. Um, just an illustration, I, I, I created this with Starry Night. This kind of puts you at a perspective from some distance viewing as the moon crosses between uh, the earth and the sun. You can see the shadow there appearing. This is the 2024 event, and you can see the shadow now sweeping up across the United States from Texas to the Northeast. Um, so that's an animation. Um, we don't have to just stick with animation, though. This is another animation. This is, this is uh, illustrating uh, the broader shadow, which is where you would see a partial eclipse, and that dot in the center, which is where you would see totality. Again, greatly speeded up. That's what the, the shadow of the moon will do on April 8th, 2024. And this is actual photographic footage from a Japanese weather satellite from a 2016, a 2016 event. And you can watch as that shadow sweeps across um, Indonesia and uh, the Western Pacific Ocean. So that's actual uh, footage of the shadow. And even better, this is the 2017 event. Here we go. So you can see the shadow crossing there in August of 2017. And yeah, that one only plays once. So um, it's worth doing. This is the uh, 21st century in total eclipses. So this is all of the events in the 21st century. So you can see the 2017 event that we experienced six years ago. Here's the April 8th event that is upcoming. And I'll talk a little bit more about the other ones that are, are coming up. Uh, but uh, just a, a quick word about weather. Uh, people talk about, you know, where, where do I have the best chance of getting clear weather? This is just a map showing the percent uh, of sky coverage with clouds. And you can see how the numbers are lower down in Texas. And as you head toward the middle of the country, the numbers get higher. And there's a pocket up there in Ohio where they get into the 70% range. So you know, statistically, your best chance is in Texas, but not by that much. I mean, you can get clouds on a given day, a given hour, anywhere. Um, we got really lucky in the 2017 event that almost everybody coast to coast had good weather. There were a few exceptions to that, but most people got to see totality. We're crossing our fingers for April. This is just a color-coded map now where the, the blue shows the best percentage, the least median cloud coverage. You can see Mexico is the best bet. As soon as you cross into Texas, you start to get into that green, which is around a 50% probability point. And then as you go up into Indiana, Ohio, and in the Northeast, that percentage, uh, the median fraction uh, or chance of clouds increases as you go toward the Northeast. You know, it means nothing, again, because it all depends on where you are on that day. And um, most people plan their observing destination with the contingency of mobility. That if, if, the, if the day before, the forecast for the eighth is terrible where you are, you want to be in a position where you can hop in your car check all of your forecast apps and drive a couple hundred miles to where the probability might be a little bit better, where that hole in the clouds might be. I hope you don't have to do that. I hope I don't have to do that, but it's always a possibility. There are a lot of people who have traveled hundreds or thousands of miles to see an eclipse and gotten clouded out. It, it does happen. Not the passport? <laughs> uh, I, yeah, I'm going to have my passport, but I don't have a contingency plan for traveling in Mexico yet. Uh, so yeah, I, I don't know what I'm going to do. One last. <clears throat> this is just a graph that shows location by city. So you can, again, see those Mexican cities are where the graph dips the lowest. Once you hit Texas, our location is very close to Uvalde. And, and as you travel um, east and north, the percentage, again, that the, the it's a, it's a probability, you know, 
equation, uh, but the probabilities get lower as you travel northeast. But the differences aren't that great. The differences being in Texas is not that much better than being in Buffalo, Rochester, New York, for instance. So, uh, you know, you go where you can go and you hope for the best. So, uh, yes. Chosen a spot. Oh, sorry. If you've chosen a spot and uh, you don't want to hop in the car and zoom down the uh, freeway, then where you are, if you're in the path of totality, even if it's cloudy, it will get dark, won't it? Yeah. If you're, let's say you're under a totally overcast sky, so worst possible scenario, completely socked in with overcast sky, um, to the point where you can't even really locate the sun, you will have four minutes of eerie darkness. Um, and you will see some of the animal phenomena that people talk about. It'll probably get cooler. Um, you know, yeah, birds going to roost and, and things like that, but you will not see the spectacle of the sun in the sky. Um, I know that certain locations in Illinois in, in 2017 had very localized, puffy, you know, fair weather cumulus clouds. And there were people observing in the football stadium at Southern Illinois University. And the football stadium was the victim of a transient cloud. And, and some people didn't get to see it. Kevin. Yeah, John, just a word of warning. If you are in a position where you're going to pick up and move to another location, don't expect to just pull off of an interstate. Um, it, as we saw in 2017, going through Tennessee and going through Kentucky, the interstates had um, uh, markers up and uh, placards up saying no stopping for eclipse. And the police were watching. They did not want to have a traffic tie up on the interstates. So make sure that you get off onto a side road or something like that. Don't plan on pulling off on interstates. Definitely not on interstates. And you know, if you, if you do find yourself in that situation, there will be hundreds of other people who are also in that situation. Competition for those spots to pull off, whether it's a rest stop or um, you know, a, a side road or something like that could be fierce. And it, it can get dicey because there are a lot of people competing for those spots. You're good. I, I was in, in Nebraska for the last one. And if you got off on the country roads, every farmer was charging twenty-five to fifty dollars to watch the eclipse. So they were they were making a lot of money. Yeah, and, was... and the one we stopped in actually, they were feeding you. They charged fifty bucks for a car, but they fed you. <laughs> that, that actually is cheaper than parking for the football games on Saturday. Uh, just a word about planning. You know, if you're sitting here in September and you haven't made plans yet for April you're probably not going to get a hotel room within 100 miles of the ground path, of the shadow path of the eclipse. If you do find a hotel room, don't be surprised if the price is four to five times what a normal hotel room. So if it's like a, the place where you could normally expect a $100 hotel room, don't be surprised to see them going for five or $600. Three to six. Yeah. It's, um, it's dicey. Camping is great if you are equipped and ready for camping. Camping is much easier, but all the campsites within the path are long since reserved. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's the point now where planning is difficult, but not impossible. And uh, because you only have to travel to Crawfordsville, Indiana, it's the closest location from Madison, um, there's no reason you can't drive down uh, find a coffee shop or a mall or a, you know, whatever, pull into a parking spot, get out of your car, enjoy the eclipse, and then get a bite to eat with a, a few thousand of your best friends. You can do it. It is, it is doable uh, because you don't have to necessarily stay overnight if you just drive to northern Indiana. Uh, you have to the traffic. The, the, traffic, the, the, the traffic is going to be an issue, especially getting out more so than getting in, uh, but getting into um, local t time in, in Indiana, it's, uh, I believe it's about 2 p.m. totality. So you're talking about the middle of the afternoon, give or take a few minutes. Uh, yes. 
local Piggly Wigglies were having a, uh, an event where they were selling T-shirts in their parking lots. Uh, I saw the I saw the eclipse at the Piggly Wiggly. <laughs> yeah, the, um, the the buzz will be growing to the point where people now might not be thinking about charging twenty five dollars to park in their their uh, wheat field, but in in April they will be thinking about that. Uh, the buzz will grow and. There's going to be a lot of press around this. It's, it's going to be a very hot item come that first week of, of April. Um, I just wanted to say one quick word about the Saros cycle. This is the most technical thing I'm going to do. The Saros cycle is just this name for this phenomenon where the position of the sun, the moon, and the earth tend to repeat on a period of about 6,585 days. It's about 18 years in a fraction. And that means that eclipse phenomenon will also repeat because the eclipse depends on the position of the sun, the moon, and the earth. And so this is how astronomers thousands of years ago were able to predict eclipses. So 6585.3211 days comes out to about 18 years and 11.3 days. And that 0.3 ends up being really important for a reason that will become obvious. I want to go back to the eclipse of uh, March 7th, 1970. This is an important eclipse in MAS history because in March of 1970, 20-year-old um, Eric Thede, who I see is not here tonight, and Wynn Wacker, recently deceased Wynn, uh, traveled to Mexico to see this eclipse in uh, what has become kind of a legendary trip in the annals of the you know, MAS lore. Eric talks about this trip often. Um, this was part of Saros 139. If you move forward 18 years, 11 days, and a third, about eight hours, the circumstances repeat. So there's, there's the period again. So here is the eclipse of March 18th, 1988. And if you look at the, the shape of the, the eclipse path, you see it's almost identical, but because of that eight hours, because that third of a day, the Earth has rotated a full third. So instead of being over the eastern United States, in 1988, the eclipse was over the, the western Pacific Ocean. But the shape of the event was the same because the circumstances of the sun, the moon, and the earth basically had repeated identically. Fast forward another 18 years, the eclipse of March 29th, um, 2006, there is the same shape, basically the same eclipse now taking place over Africa and eastern Europe. And you go forward another 18 years, and you arrive at April 8th, 2024. And this is, is, is basically, as, as the ancients used to say, one turn of the wheel. It's the same eclipse that Eric and Wynne observed back in 1970. And Eric is going to be there. I'm disappointed that Eric didn't make it tonight, but uh, Eric is, is planning, I believe, to go to Texas, not far from where it will be. Um, they call that triple Saros phenomenon the exelegmos, uh, which is Greek for one turn of the wheel, a period of 54 years and 33 days. And it's cool that the 2024 eclipse is kind of the culmination of that 1970 eclipse that uh, was observed by MAS members way back when. So whatever you have to do, take a day off work, gas out the car, whatever you have to do, get yourself to the location where you will be able to see this event in April of next year. I'm just curious, is, is the star over the letter M in uh, Mexico, is that actually Mexico City? Um, the, the symbol here, yeah. it represents greatest eclipse. Oh. That's, where, that's where the geometry, that's, that's oh, where, Mexico City, sorry, yeah, essentially the period of the eclipse is the longest there, and it's, you know, it's the, 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 the shadow is the roundest because the geometry with the center of the Earth and so forth is the most exact. So that's, that's the central part of the eclipse. And then it's, it's kind of, uh, the shadow is elongating as it travels up the, the northeastern U.S. from there. Yes. Yes. Can you also be at Mexico there? Will that then be the 70 minutes, or how long will that be? And the maximum time in Mexico, I believe, is, is close to, but not over five minutes. It's like four minutes and 50 seconds or something like that. By the time you get into Texas, it's probably not even quite that long, maybe four minutes and 30 seconds. Uh, it goes, so this, this eclipse is not close to being a seven minute maximum. Uh, this is a, a four minute and a fraction maximum eclipse. But yeah, you get the maximum time in Mexico as you travel toward the northeast. The time slowly shrinks, 
but I don't think it gets under four minutes anywhere in the continental US. So if you want information, there's a lot of information on the internet. This is just the only website that I'll highlight, the greatamericaneclipse.com. Great American Eclipse uh, is like a one-stop shop. You can, you can get information about filter material, about photography, about uh, prospects for weather, prospects for hotel rooms or campsites. You know, it's, it's all there. It's a great site. But there are lots of places on the internet that have this kind of information. Yes. Is that Saros uh, repeatability the same for the one that we saw five years ago? Uh, the 2017 eclipse is part of a Saros series. So the, the circumstances of the 2017 eclipse, if you add 18 years and 11 days, will be repeated in whatever, I, I don't, can't do the math that quickly in my mind, but yes, 2034, 2035, something like that. So yeah, and that, that's true. That's how, in, in the ancient world, 2,000, 4,000 years ago, people could look at the circumstances of an eclipse. If they knew approximately where it was visible, they knew about that 6,585 days plus a third. They could rotate the Earth and they could say, there's going to be an eclipse close to us. They couldn't pin it down exactly, but they could get pretty darn good for three or 4,000 years ago, which is pretty astounding. And they were doing it because they understood the Saros. They understood the Saros. If you miss April of uh, 2008, you have two opportunities coming up. Here they are. They were on the diagram that I showed before. But these, they, these are great eclipses. Again, one of them crosses the US entirely. And one of them is limited to uh, a couple of states on the northern tier there. This is August 23rd, 2044, and August 12th, 2045. These are the next opportunities in the continental US. This is what makes April 2024 so compelling. Because if you don't make this one, short of making international travel plans, because there are a lot of opportunities between now and 2044, but this is the next chance that you have in the continental US. So that's 20 years down the road. The one that I'm interested in is the April 23rd, or August 23rd, 2044, because when you hit the end of the path like that up in Montana and North Dakota, that's right at sunset. So that's a sunset, sun, two, three, four degrees, deeply eclipsed, all of a sudden totality right there on the horizon, and then it breaks out. Just wonderful opportunities, um, you know, if it's clear. And, uh, you know, I'm afraid to talk about how old I'm going to be. I'm going to be, you know, getting up in years by that point. Um, for many of us, April of 2024 kind of represents, you know, maybe our last really good opportunity. Um, a lot of times we talk about the fact that, yeah, you stay in Madison, you get a partial eclipse. When is our next chance for Madison people not to have to leave home to see totality? And there it is. September 14th, 2099. <laughs> this is a good one, by the way. If you get close to the center line of this eclipse, I forget now, it's like a six minute event. This is a long one. Uh, yeah, the downside is, as, as astronomers say, many of us will be below the local horizon in 2099. So take your opportunity and do it. So I'm going to go back to my picture. I'm going to show you a little bit more video. Um, the first video I want to show you is, uh, is, this is the Espinac eclipse. He observed it in China. This is from Russia. And this is a camera on a tripod. And now you're going you're gonna to look at this time lapse. So it's going to accelerate through. But I want you to observe, and there's no sound to this one either. But um, what you'll see at first is the overexposed sun. So deeply, deeply uh, eclipsed sun. But it's still very bright because totality hasn't happened yet. I want you to watch for what will be the shadow will be sweeping in from the right, and then totality will start, and you'll be able to see that. And then as totality increases, watch for the sun. You can literally see that shadow cone passing over this region. Let's see if that video works. So this is partial, deeply partial eclipse, but to the camera, it still looks very bright. It'll start to get dark on the right-hand side. 
And when totality comes, because it's time lapse, very quickly, and there's Venus, you can see, and now as it proceeds, watch for the light to come in there from the right again as totality ends. There's the light, shadow is cooking, and, and it's over. And so that very quickly time lapsed gives you a sense for the drama of that shadow, which sometimes you can see more obviously than other times. People who are at higher elevations have a better chance of seeing the shadow cone dramatically. Um, I've heard people observing from mountaintops, you know, not only see the shadow cone as it approaches them, the distant mountain peaks illuminated by the sun start to wink out one by one as the shadow races toward you. Very dramatic, very cool stuff. This guy, I never heard of him before. His name is Derek. I don't know his last name. Derek is a YouTube, YouTuber. He's a science educator. Uh, shown here with a model of uh, the atom he sells. Uh, his store sells those. His website, his YouTube channel is called Veritasium. He's got like two billion views. He, he does really, really good vid videos. Okay, so Derek, and I've watched a little bit of him too since I discovered him. Derek attended the 2017 eclipse in Madras, Oregon, not far from where we were. And I'm going to show you part of his video. I'm not going to show you the whole thing. I'm going to see if I can actually select. Let me just dip out of it here for a second. I don't want to bore you with the whole thing. Oh, crap. OK, I'll, I'll bore you with the whole thing. I just wanted to uh, let you know one thing. Carol, Carol's watching this on YouTube, and she just wanted me to tell, tell everyone there are Eclipse glasses on sale at uh, Camera Company right oh, now. Oh, excellent. Thank you, Carol. OK, so I don't see any way. I, I was going to skip forward to a certain time, but I, I don't see a way to do that. This guy, Derek has a little bit of a Jimmy Fallon vibe. If you know Jimmy Fallon, late night. Um, let's just watch. So I was going to skip all this, but I, I don't see how I've got my controls on there. Because he's a science educator, and he's a good science educator, I want to point out a few things about his, his program here. So here he is on the hillside. So he's going to, as the crescent gets there, he's going to talk about the shadow, how the shadows get sharper. He's very poised. Next, he's going to be very close to totality. Listen to the difference in the emotionality of his voice.
So I'm going to stop it there. I, I love that because, you know, this guy is a science educator. Even though he had never seen one before, this was his first eclipse, he knew what to expect. He shot thousands of hours of educational video. This guy knows how to be poised in front of the camera. And I just love the fact how the only thing he could do was say, oh, my gosh, I don't even know what's happening. And it's just his, his degree of flummoxedness. Is, is not far from how I felt. It was, it was amazing. I remember I had tears in my eyes. Uh, and my daughter, who was stoic and she you know, hardly ever cries, she was looking at me and I could tell. You know, she had tears in her eyes too. It was like, it was, it was an experience. It was, it was amazing. And, and that's why it is worth driving that last 20 miles or 200 miles or however many you know, miles you are away from totality to get yourself to totality. Um, this is, is another one of the phenomenon that, that people frequently will point out, especially if you're near trees. The dappled sunbeams that, that come through the leaves of trees, um, all of a sudden you realize that you're not just looking at amorphous light, you're looking at a thousand pinhole cameras. And each one of them will project an image of the eclipse onto the ground or onto the side of a house or, or whatever. And you know, it's, it's remarkable. And if you're not someplace where you have trees nearby, you can see this, you know, people will take, I've seen people take a colander out of their kitchen and just hold the colander up and let the colander cast a shadow. And instead of, you know, a couple hundred holes, you'll have a couple hundred little suns with a bite or a crescent. So, you know, it's a, it's a great phenomenon to see. Um, one of the other phenomenon, uh, this, you know, basically that's what a pinhole projector does and people make pinhole projectors. Another great way to look at a, a partial eclipse where you don't have to look directly at the sun to do this by using a box and a piece of tin foil with a little hole, you know, a pinhole. So um, very possible. The other thing I want to talk about, and I'll end with this, is the phenomenon of shadow, shadow bands. Shadow bands is something that you see uh, just before totality starts and just are, just after totality is over. So when you're talking about a very, very deeply eclipsed sun in those moments before totality begins. So this is obviously a cruise ship, and this is a video shot on a cruise ship, and, and the camera stays in this position. The eclipse is up out of frame to the right. You see people you know, looking in that direction. And this is going to be a movie of just before totality begins. And you'll see this guy standing in the middle will turn around and point to the white panels of the ship uh, and point out to the others that he's seeing the shadow bands and you'll see other people begin to look at those too. November 2012, the celebrity ship Millennium. So we'll switch to another view on the white wall. It's hard to see, but once you see it, it's unmistakable. Rapidly moving, shimmering shadows. And basically, it, it apparently is that very razor thin sun casting shadows on the movement of thermal atmospherics. Okay, so 
in, um, in 2017, Dan anticipated this and family put those sheets on the ground. And the reason the sheets were on the ground because we wanted to give ourselves the best possible chance to spot the shadow bands. And I, I will never forget, you know, in the minute or so, the seconds before totality, we all walked over to the sheets and we all marveled at, at the spectacle of the shadow bands. And as totality inched closer and closer, my memory is the shadow bands were so intense, you didn't need the sheet because we were looking at soil, so brown earth, dead vegetation, and the shadow bands were just massively obvious, just, you know, pulsating across the ground. It was, it was one of the amazing things. This is another video. Somebody taped some white paper to the side of a car, I think, or a house or something. And this is a little bit better video of the shadow band phenomenon. And they'll put the timings up on the screen so you can tell that this is 90 seconds before totality begins. Can't really see anything yet. It's really tough to do because there's so many things competing for your attention. You want to look at the sky, you want to look at the sun, you want to check back and see the shadow bands, you want to monitor your own emotion and the emotions of people around you. 60 seconds. And now you'll start to see them. And as that 60 seconds winds down to zero, they get more intense. And you'll actually see the camera stays pointed at the paper. When totality begins, you'll just see it get dark. This video is pretty good. This, this gives you a flavor for, for what they actually look like. You can tell the light levels are falling. And apparently this doesn't happen with every totality. Sometimes you see shadow bands, sometimes apparently you don't. But this is a really good illustration. Now we're down to just a few seconds. And Boom. And you can hear the reaction of the crowd. So, shadow bands. <clears throat> so, that's it. Uh, reminder, we've got meetings before then. You know, we've got October, November, December, and so forth. But in March will be our next presentation here devoted to the eclipse just one month prior. Uh, Jeff and Bob will uh, regale us with uh, some technicals, some photographs, and I expect it to be, again, deeply motivational and probably deeply inspirational. Uh, Jeff and Bob are both great speakers, so come back and join us in March. Don't stay away. You know, come, come back next month, too, but March will be our next Eclipse meeting, and I'll leave you with Andrea's, uh, Andrea's picture. I hope... You all have good luck, good weather, and safe travel. Thank you. Any questions? You're good. Uh, I'm sorry, let's go Kevin first. Kevin. Okay. Um, you, you saw Derek here carrying his Star Tracker too. Uh, what's the utility of Star Tracker for uh, observing the eclipse? Is it in beneficial or I, I believe it's beneficial I have a star tracker so it's just a little you know box that basically you polar align it and it tracks with the rotation of the earth the benefit is you can get lined up on the Sun with your filter on refine your focus make sure everything is, is neat and focused when totality comes if you want to take pictures you don't want to have to be unscrewing re-aiming the camera Rescrewing, oh, it's not quite right. Got to unscrew it again. Got to, re you know, you don't want to be. You got four minutes. The tracker allows your camera to be pointed at the sun reliably, so you can focus on the million other things that you need to focus on and not have to worry about pointing your camera when totality happens. Because you want to be looking, you want to experience it with your eyes. If you're taking pictures, you don't want the pictures to so dominate 
that you miss the rest of that four minutes. Right. So because trackers it, are good. Trackers right. are good. And that's that's the other comment I was going to make because it is a sensory experience. Uh, you, know, you the temperature change the the. Yeah. The, you know, you can go from a totally still day in the heat of the day, and all of a sudden you have a cool breeze coming in yeah. on, on totality. There's, so you know, the the animals change, the birds change, the crickets change. Yeah. There's everything. so much. There is so much, and if if you're if you're trying to take pictures, it's really good to rehearse ahead of time, spend a few days practicing, so that you you know every every step you need to take. You can pretty much do automatically. Uh, when we watched the Fred Espinac video, I, I could have pointed it out at the time, you heard beeping in the background. Fred had a pre-programmed, um, you know, like maybe a phone or an app or something that was giving him cues. Now it's time to do this. Now it's time to take this picture. Now it's time to move over to my other camera. So his, his actions were very synchronized. This was Fred's 70th eclipse or something like that. So he had a lot of practice, but it's good to have a plan and it's good to try not to do too many things. That's why in 2017, I just had the wide field camera. I wanted to have the sensory experience. And I'm grateful that my daughter got some pictures, but I was able just to spend the two minutes kind of looking at the sun. Yes? Could you touch briefly on some logistics um, or plans you might want to make? So for example, if I'm trying to find a place to watch should I get there at the crack of dawn and claim a spot? Is it more important to be mobile in case the weather changes? Is it worth trying to reserve a spot in advance or drive around a couple hours before and see if you can find a farmer? Such great questions. Um, you know, the answer to many of those questions is like, you know, it kind of depends. You'll know by the night before what your forecast is. And you'll know whether you're going to be able to wake up on Monday morning and, and find a spot and hunker down, or whether you're going to need to stay mobile. Hopefully, you're going to be in the first group. Um, I would do some research ahead of time to try to find a suitable location. Starting now, six months, seven months in advance, that's when the farmers have started to realize how much money they can make with their fallow field. And uh, so if you, just, you know, do a little internet surfing in central Indiana, you'll start to see those farmers advertising where you can come, they've got a food truck set up, they've got porta potties, and you can drive in and park your car and, and, and you can observe with, you know, again, probably a few hundred other people. Opportunities like that will start to surface now and in the next couple of months. Um, opportunities for those Piggly Wiggly parking lots and, and uh, rest stops along the highway or whatever, those are iffier because, uh, again, there will be competition for those spots. It'll be good to get someplace at least a couple of hours in advance. If, it, if totality is happening at 2.04 local time, you don't want to be in your car at five minutes to two, hoping to find a parking place. A couple hours, give yourself time, and then when it's over, don't think about just hopping back in your car and driving. You know, be prepared to spend, you know, maybe an hour or two letting the other people clear out before you try to get out. Uh, but yeah, you want to do as much pre-planning as you can so you have a spot or a variety of spots, candidate spots, in mind so that you don't, so that you're not left scrambling at literally the last minute. The eclipse waits for no one and, and you've got to be, you've got to be there when it hits. I imagine a lot of it might depend on your personality and what you're willing to do in a very short period of time. So. Yeah. Right, strategies for lots of people. Right. Yeah, I just wanted to say that, again, I was in Nebraska for the last one, and it was about a little bit over two minutes. And when I heard this one was going to be over four minutes, because I'm thinking of going down to Arkansas, actually, if I can make it. Um, there were so many things I wanted to do in those two minutes that I feel like four minutes is almost an eternity. So if you, if you saw the one before, this one is going to be a lot better because you're going to have a lot more time to do things and forget what you should be doing and just experience it. Yeah. There are stories of professional astronomers on eclipse expeditions that cost thousands of dollars. The astronomers, you know, they're assigned to, to operate this camera or that camera. And there are stories of astronomers literally going slack jawed and staring up at the sky because they're, they're just paralyzed and, and they lose all that science that they were supposed to get. So it can happen to anyone. 
Okay, along the, the path of totality, there will be just a ton of different uh, locations where they have festivals or events or whatever where people will be gathering and you'll be able to go and see the eclipse there. What I had to do in Nebraska was I had plan A, B, C, and D. A was a couple hours before the eclipse, figure out, okay, but go to this festival that happened over Bill Nye's science guy was. Uh, that didn't work out. I saw the clouds were coming in, so I went to B. That didn't work out. Then I went to C. That didn't work out. And plan B was to find the rural road that was that I had planned out that I could go like a bat out of hell on until I outran the clouds. And then over in Cairo, Nebraska, we saw the eclipse. Now, the interesting thing about the eclipse, when it got dark, I've never heard anybody talk about this ever before. The eclipse comes, and all sorts of weird things happen. It's like being in the twilight zone in some ways, because you are in twilight. But it's a completely different type of twilight. Every twilight you're in, in normal space, you're getting red filtered light. This is not red filtered light. This is blue filtered light. You're getting the scattered light from the blue, scattered from the blue sky. It is utterly different from anything you've ever experienced before in the twilight. It's not like anything. Questions everyone hasn't asked questions before, but just don't forget to breathe during the during the eclipse. That's my you don't advice. Want to pass up. Yes, sir. All right, I have a comment from uh, YouTube. It said the Indianapolis uh, Airport hotels haven't figured out the eclipse event, and had uh, and had at least a couple of months ago rooms at a, at prices two to uh, two hundred dollars to two hundred fifty dollars. Everything else was 800 at uh, Hilton, and et cetera, sites. Good to know. Uh, yes? Uh, Just out of curiosity, how many people saw the last eclipse? All right, the next question, I guess, Kevin. Yeah, just a, a tip. Uh, you, you were asking about how far in advance you have to plan. We happened to be at a wooded campsite that was opposite a field where we were setting up. We went out and set up our equipment, still within eyesight of where we were camping, uh, but we went out and set it up in the morning. The eclipse was coming in the afternoon. And uh, we were glad we did that because by the time it was getting close to the eclipse time, a lot of people showed up in their field. We had a coven of witches that showed up in the field. <laughs> Uh, there, were, there was a lot of very, very strange people. Speaking of Twilight Zone, uh, you get you, you get uh, go around uh, before the eclipse and get a chance to know your neighbors too, because it's a very interesting experience. Yeah, speaking of those crossroads in Texas, I'll be very disappointed if there isn't a stone circle constructed there very shortly. But, uh, do anybody else have any questions for John? Oh yes, yeah. I just wanted to make a comment. Another option is you're not going to probably find this in Indiana or Illinois, but if you get further to the south, uh, on federal lands, uh, national forests and BLM sections, you can usually do what's called dispersed camping, where since it is public federal land, you have a legal right to just set up a tent and camp. But you need to make sure that you have a map and you know you're in the right spot, because if you're on public land, you might actually get shot. So. That's another thing to consider if you're willing to drive a little further and willing to do a little more research and having trouble finding an actual campground or you want kind of more of a solo experience. When uh, uh, John and I were viewing in Oregon at the last one, you know, there's a random section of BLM land here and there and you could almost see the boundaries because, you know, they were just covered in tents from people who, for whatever reason, you know, didn't want to pay for an established campground in one of these places or go to Madras, which is like Woodstock. Um, and, you know, here we were, we were 100 miles from any place you would know the name of in Oregon. And there are just tents, tents, tents set up on these, uh, this rugged badland terrain. So that's an option too. So another option, and I don't know your name, but you're obviously, you know, you're, you're, you're going through these thought processes now. Another thing that you could do, join our Facebook group. MAS is a very active Facebook group. There will be a lot of talk, a lot of message threads, a lot of questions and answers and opinions on places like our Facebook group, 
thousands of Facebook groups, thousands of other internet type forums, uh, Reddit, uh, Quora. Um, I recommend our Facebook group. Um, join the club and you can get access to our email list too. Same thing, it'll be, it'll be the talk of the town in the, the weeks leading up to the eclipse. And a lot of people will be asking last minute, I, I didn't make any plans yet, what can I do? And the rest of us will be trying to help you find a plan. Bonnie. So also kind of keep in mind, um, keep in mind that there are some like campgrounds where they haven't opened up reservations yet. So Army Corps of Engineers um, runs campgrounds on lakes. There's actually one just outside of San Antonio, Texas. I think it's an hour northwest of San Antonio. Really nice campground. And I believe they open up reservations six months in advance. So they haven't hit that yet. Now, you probably want to start your reservation two weeks before, <laughs> you know, because people are going to try. But anyways, yeah. that's just something. To... I started planning for this about two, two and a half, three years ago. And I was actually in Texas doing a scouting trip in 20, 2020, 2020, so you know, four years in advance. <clears throat> I went to this great state park in Texas that's right close to the center line. And I was talking to them about the eclipse. And they're kind of like, yeah, I'm vaguely aware of it. I talked to the superintendent of the park. Uh, but they didn't have any plans for reservations. The Texas state park system does not allow reservations greater than six months in advance. And they were not going to modify that plan for the eclipse because Texas has like 400 state parks. And they, they couldn't change their reservation system just for those parks in the impact. So you can bet Army Corps of Engineers, San Antonio, if it's a six month window, there are people out there on their computers waiting for midnight to strike and they're gonna descend on that website in the greatest denial of service attack you've ever seen. <laughs> Everybody is gonna be clicking that button. So, you know, it's, it's, gonna, it's gonna be dicey. So the six month windows, the eight month windows, whatever they are, there are people looking at their watches on this computer, the laptop and my phone, ready to start pressing that button. And, it's just a shit show, but you got to do it, and, and you got to find someplace. So you know, you too may be sitting on those websites at midnight, you know, waiting for the, the click. One final thought, a little bit of advice that I only partially followed in the 2017 uh, eclipse. That was my first eclipse as well, and I was told by many people, I'm an astrophotographer, Jeff, don't take your cameras. Go experience it, because for all the reasons John just showed you. It is a remarkable experience. It's, it's just incredible. That being said, um, in terms of simplifying the logistics, you'll be much more mobile. You'll be able to be much more flexible if you're not carrying 250 pounds of gear with you. So consider that, especially if it's your first time seeing a, a total solar eclipse. Just go experience it with your eyeballs and you know the solar glasses and things like that. Maybe take a camera with a tripod and you'll be doing yourself a huge favor in reducing anxiety and stress related to maybe you know, clouds or something like that if you have to move. There will be plenty of pictures yeah. afterwards. You will have no shortage of pictures. Uh, if you're like Jeff and you want your own pictures, there's no way Jeff was not going to take pictures. But he had, he had to plan carefully to avoid being overwhelmed. You can also automate. Nowadays, you can, you can set up a whole four minutes of photography in the laptop, plug it in, yeah. down to the second, and have it your way. Yeah. Whereas an iPhone video of you and your friends freaking out, that's priceless. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Set, use your phone, take a video, GoPro when you have it. I, I yeah. use the GoPro video on the last yeah. one of my kids. So feel free to stick around, mingle, talk to NAS members, ask questions. Um, I'll be here and, uh, and join us again in the coming months, especially March. And we'll be talking about all things Eclipse. Good luck. Well, thank you so much, John. John, great presentation. And uh, it's been great chatting with everyone. And we look forward to see you, seeing everyone here again on uh, Friday the 13th in October. Have a good night, everybody.